All right, welcome back to this week's episode of the Amazon Wholesale Podcast. So we've got a fun episode in store for you guys. We're gonna be talking to a young wholesale seller who is a college student, but he's already sold over a million dollars on Amazon with the wholesale business model. So we're gonna be diving into his story. Uh, but before we do, a quick message from the sponsor of this week's episode, Smart Scout. So for any of you guys that have followed me for any amount of time, you know that I love Smart Scout. I've been using it uh, for multiple years now. And what I use it for primarily is to find me wholesale leads. So it has a tool within Smart Scout called Brands, and the Brands tool allows you to essentially plug in any sort of criteria that you wanna use, and it'll spit out a list of brands that meet that criteria. So research that used to take 10, 15 hours, now only takes seconds, and I found a lot of profitable opportunities this way. So head over to smartscout.com, use code wholesale25, and get 25% off your first three months of Smart Scout. So with that, let's get right into the episode. Uh, with Wholesale Network Mastermind's newest member, Dev Patel. Dev, thanks for coming on, man. I'm looking forward to uh, talking to you uh, about your journey and kind of where you've uh, where you've been thus far. Hey, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you for having me. Yeah, hundred percent, man. So, first of all, let's give uh, give everybody kind of your background, right? You're a college student. You you run a wholesale business out of a warehouse. I think you've got a couple of employees. Maybe start from when you started on Amazon and kind of how you got to where you are now. Yeah, for sure. So. Before I even started on Amazon, I was always a hustler, right? Sold chips in high school, Gatorades, you know, you name it. And then slowly transitioned to like just selling, reselling clothes and shoes and stuff like on OfferUp. And then eventually I watched a video on Amazon and, you know, got interested with it. So when I first got started, I didn't even know about the other business models, right? All I knew was wholesale. So I started with 100% wholesale, right? So I started straight into wow. wholesale. And uh, yeah, I've been doing it for around 18 months. And when I first got started, you know, from my house, just labeling stuff and, you know, shipping out to UPS, slowly moved to the living rooms, to the garage, and then slowly started getting pallets of different products. So seven months in the business, I got my first warehouse. My warehouse is in downtown LA. So um, yeah, just been scaling and delegating since then. I have three to four part-time employees that, you know, help me pack products, package them, pallets and everything. But yeah, never thought, you know, in seven months, I was going to need a warehouse for this business, but that's the beauty of right. I love. Well, that's awesome, man. So there's a lot to unpack there, but I love the fact that you jumped right into wholesale from day one. You didn't start with arbitrage. You didn't come over from private label. Like wholesale was kind of all you knew. And so it's what you did from the start, which I think is unique because I think a lot of people that end up doing the wholesale business model, they come from another business model, whether it's arbitrage, usually arbitrage, right? But a lot of, I've, I've met a lot of folks as well that start with private label, they don't find success, they pivot to wholesale and they end up crushing it. So that is uh, awesome that that was kind of your path, which is a little different. Now, you mentioned that you have a warehouse, right? You've got, what do you say, three to four part-time employees? Yeah. So where do you find these employees? I am curious as to where people that have warehouses, where do they find those employees? Because a lot of times finding good folks to work there in the warehouse can be difficult. Mm -hmm. So like for me, this is a secret sauce to everyone, right? international college students right they're always looking interesting for jobs. so uh what i did was my warehouse it's in downtown la so i just looked up a few colleges nearby found their facebook pages and then i went to like the housing people right people that were like looking for housing or anything like that and then from there i just saw someone so i contacted that person that person you know we called they came over to my warehouse i showed them what they had to do and the job's pretty simple right you're just labeling products you can listen to music do what you want so that's how, where I, how I got my first employee. And then she basically recommended like her, her other friends. So then now I got like two more. So, you know, three like uh, completely part-time, one comes here and there. But that's how I kind of found them, right? Through like college students. That is a huge hack. I've actually never heard of anybody saying that before. So you definitely have a leg up there because you, your warehouse is in downtown LA. But I mean, most people that have a warehouse, they're going to be near a, a college of some sort, right? So looking for those college Facebook groups. And then I think, like you said, targeting maybe some of those international students would be a really good opportunity to find some kids that are super hardworking and are willing to do the work, right? Exactly. Because, you know, they come from a third world country. They know how hard it is, right? And uh, with those people, I've noticed, right, me just hiring someone else compared to like an international student, they're going to work way harder and I can trust them more because, uh, you know, they, I, they show that they are hard workers. Right, right, right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. That's a, like I said, that's a huge tip that I've never heard anybody drop before. So if you missed that, definitely rewind and, and go listen to that again. So that's awesome. So now, when it comes to the warehouse, you said three to four part time workers. Uh, how are you guys shipping your stuff out of the warehouse? Is it mainly is everything on pallets like LTL? 
Are you yeah, doing so, any full truckload shipments? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, so mostly everything is LTL. Uh, I am planning to send out my first FTL shipment this month, so we'll see how that goes. But for me, man, if you're if you're listening to this and you're just going to UPS every day, start sending out pallets right away. Like for me, ten months in the business, I was still doing UPS every single day, multiple trips. I thought I would save money, but you know, I didn't realize that with pallets. I mean, oh my god, it would get checked in late, but it would save me so much money. So right. I wanted to get my products checked in faster. So I was at UPS, but then, you know, it, it just got too tiring. So then I started doing pallets and yeah, I've just been telling, sending out pallets since then. Well, that's the good thing that you'll find about when you start sending full truckloads is that the products check in a lot of times, you know, within 24 to 36 hours, it's called live unload. Meaning as soon as it gets to Amazon's fulfillment centers, the shipment, they immediately start unloading it and check it into your inventory. So Shipping full truckloads is by far the fastest way to ship products to FBA and also the cheapest by far. So you're, you're going to see a lot of benefits once you start to do that. Sure. Now, oh. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry to cut you off. I, I did have a question though. Again, one more thing about the warehouse. So do you have like racking set up or do you kind of just have pallets laying all over the place? And this is more so out of my own curiosity because we didn't get quite get to the point where we were building out pallet racking when I had my space. Uh -huh. uh, we did kind of just had a lot of stuff laying around. So I'm curious yeah. as to how yours looks. So for me, the warehouse I have, it's like a shared warehouse, right? It's, it's totally, it's huge, right? It's over 4,000 uh, square feet big. So it's humongous, but I have like a small space, but it gives me access to like 40 loading docks, all forklifts, pallet jacks, right? So it's, it makes it really simple. Now for me on my space, uh, I just, I just put them on the floor, but you know, even on the side, um, I have pallet racks, which I could use and they, they allow me to use it. But, you know, I really don't need to since most of my stuff, you know, comes and goes within a week or so. Got it. So pretty much everything you're getting in, you're shipping right back out. You're not sitting on any product. You're not buying, say, six months of product at a time and then kind of drip feeding it into FBA. Everything that like gets in gets gone. Is that fair to say? Uh, yeah, I would say because for me in my business, uh, it's a lot of fast moving products. Like on average, I aim, I sell like 400 to 500 units per day. So they're all mm -hmm. fast movers. So, you know, if something comes in, it just goes back out, you know, it just sells. So uh, I feel like for me, the cash flow is the most important thing in the business. But since I sell a lot of fast moving items, it's, it's super healthy for me. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, what made you want to go the warehouse route versus using a prep center, right? Because I mean, me personally, I don't want to be tied down to a warehouse. I've done that before. I don't want to manage a lot of warehouse employees. I'd much rather pay a slight premium and get a prep center to do it for me. But you took the opposite route. Obviously it works, but is there any particular reason why? Yeah, I would just say having the control, right? I feel like mm -hmm. me having the control, let's say I do want to get a shipment out. I could stay there all night and I call my employees. We work overnight shift and get it done the next day, right? With the prep right. center, sometimes you may have certain weights, like two or three people ahead of you, right? Which may delay your timing. But if you have a warehouse, you have full control. Now with employees and stuff and just managing the warehouse, it is, uh, you know, it's kind of tough, especially for me since I'm in college as well. But good thing I have a shared warehouse. So anytime I get any shipments or anything, my neighbors, they basically know me and, you know, my spot. So they just put the pallet right there. So I don't even have to be there to collect anything or even ship it out since my relationships are so good. And one thing about a shared warehouse, which is amazing, I didn't even know. So the shared warehouse I have on my left, they're monsters. They're basically the second largest distributors for Alibaba. Right. They're, it's really? a 24 seven operation. They're, they're a billion dollar company basically. Right. So they have like a lot of square footage and on my right, they're basically automotive wholesalers. Right. So they basically mm -hmm. do wholesale parts. So with, with uh, a shared warehouse, one thing I learned is right networking. So by right. simply networking with these other people, now, obviously I didn't network with the Alibaba people. They're too huge, but the people on my right side, the automotive wholesalers, I basically network with them. Right. And they basically sold on eBay mostly. But now I basically got in connect with the owner. You know, we talked and I told him about my business and stuff. And now I even got their products on Amazon. So I'm selling like Toyota, nice. this, you name it, right? So you're able to buy, you bought from them, you're saying? Yeah, exactly. So it's like I have unlimited net terms, kind of. <laughs> Not unlimited, but, you know, I buy their products. I sell them on Amazon for them, right? And then we basically do a cut or whatever we decided. That's awesome. And is this their private label brand or is this uh, like other brands that they just have access to? Like basically you're able to buy through this big distributor that is your neighbor. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah. So they, they basically have accounts open with big, big brands like, you know, Subaru, Toyota and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's all uh, automotive parts, but you know, automotive parts, I never thought automotive was like a crazy thing, but now I'm looking at it, man, it sells like insane on Amazon. 
It's so oh, automotive. It's one of my favorite categories to sell on Amazon. Like I've, I've said that before tools and automotive, I think are two really underrated categories because one, both of those categories tend to have a higher average sale price than most, right? People spend a lot of money on their cars. People spend a lot of money on tools because these things are expensive. So the margins can be a little higher and there can be a little less competition. One, because it's, they're just not sexy categories. And two, because there's not a lot of sellers that are able to compete in those on those higher dollar pro, uh, products, right? Because they're more expensive. They don't have enough capital. Yeah, for sure. So what else do you sell? Uh, automotive parts are obviously part of it, but what other, like what else is contributing to you hitting, you know, close to seven figures uh, so far in the last 12 months? Yeah. So I would say I sell a lot of like candy, chocolates and stuff. Now for me, meltable season, they're my op. I hate it so much, but you know, uh, it's fine. You know, take a break, a couple of months, but yeah, I, I sell a lot of candies, chocolates, chips. So a lot of grocery, I would say my business is like almost 70, 80% grocery. And I love it. A lot of, uh, you know, I barely, barely get returns since with food items, sometimes you could see under the buy box, it says, you know, not returnable due to right. uh, food safety reasons or something like that. But yeah, I love selling grocery and then, you know, a little bit of beauty and health here and there. Now, when it comes to your sourcing, who are you buying from? Like, are you buying directly from the brand? Are you buying from distributors? Like, what does yeah. that look like? So I, I feel like 90, 90% is just with distributors and 10% is like brand direct. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's mostly distributors, I would say. And so how are you finding those suppliers? Like what is your product or what is your like supplier research process look like? Uh -huh. So for me, I mean, I haven't really even looked for a new supplier or a new product in five months, right? Because I have too many products that sell already that I could barely keep in stock. So right. uh, for me, you know, I don't really need to look for them, but I would say the best way to find suppliers, local suppliers, right? They're the best because you save on shipping. Plus you get to build a good relationship with them since you're close by, you know, you could visit them, shake their hands and talk to them. I completely agree with that. So that's a huge tip, especially if you're kind of starting out in wholesale, you know, you don't know who to contact. You don't know which suppliers are good. You don't know which supplies are bad. We'll just start by looking at who's in your town, right? If you're in any decent sized city or town, there are going to be multiple distributors in different, you know, multiple categories right there in your own town. And so that would be my advice is to look up, see who's around you and kind of build your business off of that. If you find that you've got three or four really big automotive distributors in your town or close by, then maybe you start selling, maybe your niche is kind of the automotive niche, right? Because you're kind of turning what you have all around you into your advantage. I mean, that's what I would do, right? Like for you, I know you're selling, like you said, 80% eight, of your business is grocery, but if you wanted to, I bet you could easily make it 50-50 automotive grocery. Like you could probably go so much deeper with those neighbors of yours than you probably realize. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, yeah, with the neighbors, I have relationships good. Like, you know, uh, the owner even asks you to hang out outside of work. I've seen his penthouse in Los Angeles. And you know, <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's really nice, you know, so we have a really good relationship. We like message each other every day about products, you know, what I need to restock and stuff. So yeah, automotive is insane. And I definitely need to go more deeper on that as well. Because uh, like you mentioned, yeah, the prices are obviously way higher. So, you know, more money for us to make. Right, exactly. Exactly. So when it comes to finding new suppliers, you said you're not doing any of that at all right now, no, right? No, I, because I'm you're not, just, yeah. you're just trying to go deeper with the ones that you have. Yeah, exactly. Just go deeper. And for me in my business, I have like three to four main suppliers. Right. And uh, with those, I don't really just order consist. I mean, I don't really order every single week with them. Right. But I place an order, let's say once a month. But that order is huge. Right. Maybe seven egg pallets of different products. Right. Yeah, that's I mean, that's pretty much the same boat that we're in. Right. We've got our top probably six to seven suppliers that we primarily buy, you know, 90 to 95 of our inventory from. And we just continue buying more from them, trying to go deeper with them. However, back when we were looking for more suppliers, there was, there's really two methods to do it, right? If you're looking for distributors, we would use Google and look for local suppliers in our area using a search phrase, something along the lines of, you know, category name, distributor, and then my city, right? Easy as that. You're going to find a lot of suppliers just using that phrase. Now, when it comes to finding brands, we would use Smart Scout and we would use the brands feature within Smart Scout and set, I think, just three criteria. Uh, the first criteria being monthly revenue, I think under 250K because we wanted to target those smaller to maybe mid-sized niche brands. We would choose a main category. We would set the Amazon in stock rate to maximum 60%. And then we would set the average number of FBA sellers to be a minimum of two to kind of uh, you know filter out any private label brands. 
And that right there, pretty much per category is going to give you a few hundred brands. So, you know, we would just find a list of like 1,000, 1,500 brands across two or three categories within, you know, 10, 15 minutes of research, and then just start calling down the list. And if the brand doesn't give you, didn't give us the account, we would just ask the brand, well, hey, no worries. Do you mind just referring me to a distributor that services my area here? Right. And so that's kind of how that was our system for like find the brands first and then use the brands to kind of point us to distributors. Appreciate and that mm-hmm. that'll give you a lot of a lot of supplier leads, especially even if you're new. Yeah, for sure. And even for me, right, many people think finding suppliers is a secret. Like all my best suppliers, I found them through simply Google searches. Right. Right. It's not, it's not a huge secret. But when it comes in wholesale, when it comes to just selling, I feel like there's two ways you could approach it. Most people only stick to the first way, which is you find the supplier first, go through their catalog and then, you know, uh, see their products. But you can also find the product first and then find the supplier. Right. I like to use both of those different methods because sometimes by finding the product first, you already know it's a solid product. And now your job is just to find the supplier. So sometimes that that can be easier. So if, if the first method isn't working for you, try out the second one. Yep. And that's a great tip, right? And that's pretty much our exact strategy as well. We, for the first probably two or three years of our wholesale business, we were doing that first method. We were finding suppliers and then looking for needles in a haystack, right? Hoping they had something profitable. And then once we kind of shifted our approach and shifted our mindset to, well, wait a second, we already know some products that sell well. Why don't we just go find suppliers for those exact products? Once we started doing that, it got to be a lot easier. So uh, that would be, again, uh, one of the better tips that I could give a, a newer seller is don't start with the supplier, start with the product or the brand and then find the supplier, right? For sure. Good stuff, man. Now, what does your software stack look like? Like, what are you running to to be able to build or to be able to sell, you know, about a million a year on Amazon? And the reason I ask you this is because I'm willing to bet it's a lot less, like a lot fewer products than a lot of people probably realize. Yeah. Because you don't need you know, 10 different software tools to scale this business. For sure. Yeah. Like even if you're a 10, uh, you know, like let's say a five figure seller versus an eight figure seller, you're going to use the same software, right? Right. For the most part. And for me, I use three main softwares, Jungle Scout, Rev Seller, and Keepa. And then for inventory and like profits and stuff, seller board for that. So interesting. What do you use Jungle Scout for? Because I haven't heard a lot of wholesale sellers that use Jungle Scout. Yeah. So for Jungle Scout, it just gives you like an estimator on the top. Now with that estimate, you know, it is for the entire variation. So if you are just looking at it, I want, you want to be careful of that since it's for the entire variation. But for mm-hmm. Jungle Scout, one thing I like about it is the review tool. So with the review tool, I'm able to request like, you know, within my past 90 days, how many orders I have with one click, I could request up to a hundred reviews on the page. So I think just for the review tool, I think Jungle Scout is worth it because with those reviews, right, the more reviews you have, the better chance you have also of winning the buy box as well. So it's going to help you out eventually. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. That is a good reason to use it for sure. I mean, having, at least in my experience, I think our account having a good amount of reviews, I think 1200 or 1300, something like that. Uh, I, I do feel like that helps us win the buy box more than say somebody that has, you know, 10 reviews. that's also on our same listing. So uh, you, you'll hear some people say that reviews or ratings or seller feedback is not important. It's not critical, but it helps, right? It definitely helps. Like I think Amazon has even come out and confirmed that. Um, so that's a good tip right there as well. Now, uh, so you and I met in person at ASD, right? This past, uh, I guess, April or early March, whenever that was. Uh, my first question is, what was your experience there? Like, did you get a lot out of it? Yeah, man, it was amazing. So it was my first trade show that I went to and, you know, it was ASD. Uh, my main goal to go there was, you know, just to network with other sellers and also just, you know, what suppliers and brands are there. And man, ASD, if you guys haven't been there, you guys are missing out. It's the easiest way to find suppliers. Like I walked right. for 30 minutes, I had 20 different business cards. I wasn't even looking for suppliers, right? But right. it's not easy. Just walking down, you know, people are willing to talk to you. So just explain them your business, right? And then obviously, you know, don't have Amazon seller on your card and maybe put like, you know, retailer <laughs> or wholesaler or something like that. But simply just, you know, talking to them, just, um, you know, shaking their hands, explaining your business, it's just gonna help you out. And even if you don't, people are just willing they're, they're begging for your business practically, right? So just walk past them, talk to them and you'll be, you'll be good. Yeah, that's good advice because it really is a lot simpler than most people probably realize to be successful at these trade shows. At the end of the day, you've, like you said, it's like a lot of these vendors are kind of get, not necessarily getting in your face, but like they're trying to solicit your business because I mean, they pay 
what i think the cheapest booth at asd is it, it's like 10 grand at least it might even be like 15. Wow. so they're paying good money to be there and that doesn't even include the that's just to to be there that doesn't include the cost of the booth right and everything else associated with that i had some vendors telling me how they rented the furniture they'd rented a single chair for 900 bucks for the entire <laughs> show like the it, bottom line is it costs these vendors a lot of money to be at these shows so their goal is to make sales now if you're an Amazon seller, you're at somewhat of a disadvantage because obviously a lot of vendors are going to write you off just because you sell on Amazon. But at the end of the day, if you're a serious Amazon seller and you know what you want and you're there looking to do business and you're not just kind of being timid and, and walking around and not and being shady about what you do, then they're going to be willing to work with you. That's been my experience. Uh, and it sounds like that's been your experience as well, Deb, right? Yeah, for sure. And yeah, at ASD, you know, I even saw like a few of my suppliers there. I didn't even know they were going to be there, right? Which is yeah. crazy. So at ASD, there are good suppliers. You just have to, you know, find them and, you know, talk to them. And uh, with ASD, I think I was listening to maybe one of your tweets or your podcast or something. I remember you said you like to go up to the boots that say no Amazon sellers, right? Me yeah. too. I love going to those boots because I like a challenge, right? At the end of the yeah. day, I can mend them. So I, it feels good. I'm like, you don't, you knew I was an Amazon seller. Still, I can mend you, right? And if they say you sell on Amazon, don't take it as a, ah, oh, man, sorry. Say, why wouldn't we, right? Take, yep, take exactly. Amazon because Amazon is a huge platform. And, you know, uh, people would die to get on Amazon. So take pride in you selling on Amazon and just a sound confident. Yeah. And that's, again, been my experience exactly, right? It's like, well, when they ask, do you, like, why do you, like, why do you just sell on Amazon? Why do you sell on Amazon? Because a lot of these guys, they just take these brick and mortar store owners more seriously, which kind of as they should, because if you own a brick and mortar store, you've got a lease in place, you've got employees, like you put a big investment into your business. Whereas anybody can spin up an Amazon seller account, right? So there are a lot of guys that are just unsophisticated that end up wasting these vendors time. So when they ask you if you sell on Amazon, your answer, I think is spot on. It's like, well, absolutely. Why wouldn't I? It's the biggest retail sales channel in the country. I'd, I'd be stupid not to. In fact, uh, we do, you know, X amount of revenue per year on Amazon and we're looking to buy that product uh, or that brand right there that you kind of have in the corner, right? And you kind of pivot the conversation to, to like, well, yeah, of course you do. Now let's talk business, right? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, simply just uh, if you're if you're an experienced seller and you go to ASC, best tip, just know what you you want, right? At least a few brands, because if you place a uh, order on the spot, right, your chances of getting a huge discount is amazing, right? Since you're doing it face to face, you could also get a great discount on, on the products you're looking to purchase. <clears throat> yep, that's key. I mean, at trade shows, most people that are most companies that are attending trade shows and that have boosts there are running show specials. So they're discounting products, they're cutting special deals because most of them have a quota to meet at the trade show, right? They're like, hey, we've got to sell X amount by the end of the show to make our money back. So we better sell. Right. And I mean, there was, I think on the first day of the trade show, one of our existing vendors, one that we've been doing business with for a while, had um, a sheet of products that we normally buy. But the pricing was a little higher than usual. And so I just said, guys, like, listen, we, I basically put a sample PO in front of them. I was like, this is what we can do. Like we can buy all of this. It ended up being around like 22 K with a theoretical, like 10 to 12% discount applied across most of the products. I was like, guys, listen, like you can, like, this is our PO if you want it, but at the prices that you're offering it to me, it's not going to work. And so they, they were like, all right, fine. Like they, you know, they processed it right away. They really didn't ask questions. So Again, because I knew exactly what I wanted and I was ready to move forward, it was a much easier process. Yeah, for sure. And just showing them what you want to purchase or having pictures of the products, they know you're serious, right? They know you've been selling for a while, so you know exactly what you want. And suppliers and distributors, they like when we're direct with them. It makes the job easier for them and also for us. Right. I mean, it's so much easier, right? Because at the end of the day, probably 19 out of 20 people that contact these suppliers that ask about products that, you know, make an inquiry end up actually purchasing anything. So when you just kind of show up out of thin air and you place an order right away, even if you're selling it on Amazon, they think you're great because you're just, you know, a customer just fell into their lap, right? Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Now when you're, so let's talk about your existing suppliers. So guys that you've been buying from for a while now, Sounds like you said you're doing a lot of just replenishing the same products that you've been buying, but are you also 
looking for new products from your existing suppliers, like trying to widen your catalog with them? Yeah, I, w- I would say here and uh, like here and there, but l- my biggest issue is just keeping the products that are already selling in stock, right? So I don't think there is no point of me just, you know, uh, trying to find new products. Now, currently I am trying to, you know, leverage loans, line of credit. So, you know, go to credit unions and stuff to get more capital. But yeah, if I had 100K to spend today, I could spend it right now, right? So it's, it's, it's like, I just need more money to scale. But yeah, not really looking for new products or anything. I would love to, but I just don't have enough, you know, capital for it right now. And so what's causing you to have trouble to keep your existing products in stock? Is it that your suppliers don't have enough on hand? Are you just running out of stock because you're not ordering in time? Like what's the main issue there? I feel like the biggest issue is, first of all, my credit limits, right? Since I'm young, I don't have a long enough credit history. So every time I apply for a card, denied automatically. And my credit limits, they're just horrible. Like I place one PO and it's maxed out, right? So it's really tough to maintain that. And also just the capital issue, right? I already have so many products, just I need to restock. So if I just had more capital, which I did recently get a loan offered from Amazon Lendistry, but the interest rate Mm -hmm. was like 11%, which is, I don't think it's worth it. It's too high. So I might as well go to like a local bank or credit union and see what they offer me. But yeah, the capital would be the biggest issue for me. But if if I had that capital, I'd be able to scale way more. Yeah, and a, a local bank or a local credit union or even like regional bank or credit union is going to be your best bet. That's that's who we have our line of credit through. So we uh, use a bank. They're regional to like Eastern North Carolina. We've been banking with them for a number of years, have a lot of personal accounts with them, other business accounts with them. So bottom line is we have a relationship with them, whereas with a Chase or Wells Fargo or one of those banks, it's just going to be more difficult to get a foot in the door because of how big they are. So I find that those, like I said, those state and local uh, or regional banks and credit unions tend to be a little easier to work with, and they're willing to compete for your business, give you better terms, give you more credit, uh, kind of try to make it work as much as they can. Um, And another tip too, so when it comes to banking, right, like I said, I want to work with smaller banks, but I also don't want to have all my eggs in one basket because when it comes to financing, right, there are we're gonna, you are going to want to uh, consider multiple options. So like, for example, I have most of my uh, funds and accounts and everything with that bank that I mentioned that I have the line of credit with, but I also have uh, like just a savings account at another local bank and a uh, another business of mine has, I have the business checking and savings at another like bit local business bank. So, uh, and the reason for that is because if I ever need to get a loan or if I ever need to get any sort of financing, I want to be able to contact those three banks that I'm already a customer of. So I have a pre-existing relationship and kind of have them uh, bid against each other. Right. Yeah. To like get to compete, which is, and, and yeah, you know, do the same thing with wholesalers to make them compete with their prices. So it definitely works for sure. Well, and that's, that's such a good point too. Like I wasn't even planning on getting into this topic, but like that works in Amazon wholesale as well. Like if you, If you have a price on a product, we do this all the time. Like, let's say we're buying product A for $16 normally. Uh, Well, it's so much easier for me to just go to their competitor and say, hey, we normally get this product for 16. This is how many we want to buy. Can you beat it? And if here's the thing is like, if they can beat it, like if they have the margin to beat it, they're going to beat it because they want to steal that business away from their competitor, right? If they can't beat it, it's because they're probably very close to their break even. And they're like, listen, like we, we simply can't sell it for that low. And then they'll tell you and then you'll know. Right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And back to the banking, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, use the profit first method, right? Yep. Yeah. So that's, that's something we've been using since I think beginning of 2023 is when we implemented that. Ah, nice. Nice. I would love to use it, but I guess I just can't even open more accounts or anything, my credit history. So I just had to wait a couple of months and, you know, see what card I really want the chase, um, ink premiere which is a 2.5%, mm-hmm. right? Every time you spend 5K or more. And since yep. my POs are huge, right? I feel like I can really use that. And I could also, uh, you know, uh, compare that with uh, Melio. So that would be great as well. Yeah, the that Chase Inc. Business Premier is a great card because like you said, it's two and a half per, unlimited 2.5% cash back on purchases over 5K. And then anything under 5K is unlimited 2% cash back, right? So as far as I know, that's the best cash back offer on the market. And I mean, you'd be surprised how much that f- extra half a percentage in cash back adds up. It adds up significantly. Uh, and then you mentioned Melio, right? That's what we use to 
pay all of our vendors uh, where we get to pay them with a credit card, but they get cash right in their bank account. And then Melio charges a fee of, I think it's 2.9% for that service. So basically if you use that Chase Inc. Business Premier credit card you can get two and a half percent back and use Melio to process the payment, which is going to be a 2.9% fee. Well then, you know, you're only paying the difference there 0.4% to send your vendor cash and you get, you get, you don't have to part with that cash, right? Cause you're paying with a credit card. So that's a really like cool method for extending your cash as much as you can for minimal cost. Yeah, for sure. Now what's next in your business? Like what, what are your goals for your business? Yeah. So my goal, I definitely want to hit, you know, 200 K months by the end of this year. So my goal ever since I started has been to just hit a million, which right now I'm at like 960. Like I already hit a million, you know, my entire history, but I mm -hmm. want to see those orange bars last 12 months, right? I want to see those. Yeah. So I'm almost there, but you know, ever since I started, even, you know, every day I wake up, I have a goal, you know, I wrote it down. One million yeah. for 21. So I uh, love it. this month, I think I'm going to hit it. You know, that, that was my goal, but uh, for 2024 is definitely 200 K months. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's a really good goal to shoot for. Right. And when it comes to seeing that first, like a uh, million dollar, like total over the last 12 months, I remember when I saw that for the first time, I was like, I think we were on vacation for my cousin's birthday. And I remember sitting there, I was refreshing my phone all day. I was, we were at like 998 K the 999. And like, you know, I'd sit there and refresh it 10 times over the next hour until we hit that 1 million. And I got, had to get the screenshot, right? <laughs> yeah. You got to get the screenshot. <laughs> so it's, it's like buried somewhere in my, in my, uh, camera roll from like years ago, but that was, I remember that being a fun moment. Yeah. Now, um, so you say that you want to hit that million dollar mark. Do you want to continue to do so with, you know, by using distributors? I mean, not million dollars, sorry, 200 K a month. Do you want to continue, do you want to get there by continuing to do what you're doing and mainly buying from distributors? Or do you have any plans to maybe start reaching out directly to some brands or doing any sort of bundling or anything like that to yeah. kind of add to your business? So I definitely want to get into bundling, but I know it's it's a tough, it's kind of risky, right? Since it's against Amazon's TOS if you do try to, you know, bundle some stuff together. Now, for me, I feel like I'm going to stick to just working with distributors since my relationships are so good with them. Like my distributors or my sales reps, right? Like they even invite me to their customer appreciation events and their raffles and nice. stuff. So it's, it's really great, right? And with my sales reps too, I treat them right every for like holiday, Thanksgiving, you know, Christmas, I give them gift cards. And I give them meaningful gift cards, right? I don't just give them a Starbucks. Like one of my sales rep, he has pets. So I went to Petco and, you know, got him a gift card. Now that's nice. super meaningful. And now with that sales rep, right, he's where we're so cool. Like he even just emails me free leads. He's like, hey, Dev, uh, this seems this is our best selling product. You could check it out if it sells well on Amazon or not. And one of the leads he gave me was literally a crazy product 3,000 times per month. And then my first order with him, I was like, you know what? We'll take a thousand units. So nice. he's literally just giving me free leads. But, you know, this is what relationships does. And in this business, relationship is like an unbreakable discount that no money can buy. Right. right? I could give That's you my so supplier, true. but you're going to have the worst pricing and I'm going to have the best pricing. The only difference is the relationship. So focus on building a relationship. This whole business is long term, right? Yeah, you're going to make profit your first month, second month. But if you really want to grow, think long term. That's such a good way to look at it. And that's another, I mean, what you pretty much hit the nail on the head, right? It's like, for example, at this most recent ASD, I hosted some walkthroughs where I would walk people around and literally introduce them to my suppliers that were at ASD. I had like four of my suppliers at ASD. And I had people ask me, they were like, why, why would you do that? Why would you tell people who your suppliers are and much less introduce them to your sales rep? And I was like, well, because of the relationship, right? Like the last thing I'm worried about is somebody who has is meeting my supplier for the first time stealing my business like if anything my supplier is coming to me with the best deals first they're coming to me with the best terms like and i also look good by referring them a customer that you know may or may not buy something from them but at the very least it shows that i'm looking out for their business as well so yeah there's you know not to say that you want to go out there and tell everybody who your best suppliers are but if they, if somebody finds out your suppliers or if you share that information, it's not the end of the world, but as long as you've got a good relationship with your sales rep, right? That's everything. And ideally you would have a good relationship, not only with your sales rep, but other people in the company as well, because sales reps and I mean, anybody at a company, they come and go. I mean, it, what happens if you have a great relationship with your sales rep, but they get fired or they quit or they go to another company? And you get assigned a new guy that you've never met before and you got to start over from square one. And 
I, the reason I bring that up is because that's happened to me at least twice, right? So I'm speaking from experience here that get to know other salespeople on their team, get to know their manager, get to know the uh, administrative person, like get to know as many people as you can at the company. Yeah, for sure. And like when I first got started, right, one thing I really focused on was consistency. So when right. I started, I made it a rule. I would send out a test order every single day. Doesn't matter what it is. I did that for like two months straight, tested out a nice. new product every single day, right? And that's why I'm at where I'm at right now, right? I have so many products because I tested out a lot. And with being consistent, right, since you're emailing or calling the sales rep every day and placing those orders, other people in the company also start to notice you. So one yep. day I remember I called my sales rep, but he wasn't there. So the manager picked up and then, you know, I was talking and then they were like, oh, are you blank my company's name? Yep. Even the manager knew you. about me because, you know, I always ask for discounts or, you know, whatever it is, but they know I'm a reliable customer. And even sometimes, let's say I just need to place like a quick order for like one item and it doesn't meet their MOQ or anything. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they just ship it out for free for me, right? It's because nice. I'm a customer to them. So yeah, build a good relationship with them, with the sales reps and everyone else in the company for sure. Yeah, hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. And also to kind of, you know, put that thought to rest is these, you know, if you're a salesperson, if they do end up leaving and going to another company, well, what if they end up going to another distributor or another manufacturer, right? And then that relationship is going to transfer. Like you're going to have opportunities at that new company immediately. So, you know, that you, that's really something that can't be taken from you, which is really cool. Now I want to ask you how important it's been to get active on social media because you're super active on Instagram. Uh, you're active on Twitter. You're networking with people inside our wholesale network, right? Like you're doing all the right things to get yourself out there. What would you say the ROI has been there on your business and also just like the friends you've made too? Oh man, a thousand percent for sure. You know, best tip if you are starting out or if you're already doing, just re record your journey, right? Because other people see yep. it, they get motivated. And for me, when I first got started, it was bad. I didn't even use Keepa until like six months in my business. I was just going based really? on business and stuff. Yeah. But so, you know, by getting on social media and stuff, you know, you start to see videos, you start to discover other content creators, and you just observe all the information. And simply by just following a bunch of people or just posting about it, you're going to be surrounded with the information. So it's going to be in your head and, you know, you're just going to use it without even knowing that you're using that information. So definitely get on social media as soon as you can. You don't have to post anything, but, you know, just, just look at all the videos, look at everything that other content creators are offering. Yep. I agree. I mean, at the very least it's like get on there and consume, but ideally you'd be putting yourself out there, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on Instagram, whether it's just even in the YouTube comments, right? Because at the end of the day, the more other Amazon sellers you get to know, the quicker you're going to scale your business. Cause you'll be sharing tips. You'll be encouraging each other. You'll be holding each other accountable. A uh, lot of good stuff to come from that. And now that's actually a big reason that we built the wholesale network is to help other wholesale sellers find a community with which to grow their businesses and uh, larger sellers to network with other larger sellers, right? Because there's nothing really like that out there. Uh, Dev is actually the newest member of the Wholesale Network Mastermind Group. And if you guys are interested in finding out more about that, you can head over to wholesalenetwork.io. Uh, and before we go, guys, if you wouldn't mind taking a quick second to like the video if you're on Facebook or give us a positive rating on Apple or Spotify, it really helps get the podcast in front of more people. Dev, before we go, where can people find out more about you? Yeah, uh, my Instagram is most active, right, at BuyBoxWinner. Same thing with uh, with Twitter and TikTok. So, yeah, you can find me there. If you guys need help, shoot me a message. I'd love to help you out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the time, man. I'll talk to you soon. I'll see you inside the Discord. Yes, sir. Take care.